one, the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Mario Ritter Jr., Katie Weaver, and Brian Lynn. Later, Kelly Jean Kelly will present America's Presidents. But first, here is Mario Ritter Jr. Lebanese officials say ammonium nitrate, a substance used as fertilizer in agriculture, likely caused the massive explosion in Beirut. The explosion killed at least 100 people and injured more than 4,000 others on Tuesday. It flattened much of the port and damaged buildings across the capital city. Lebanon's president, Michel Aoun, said more than 2,700 tons of ammonium nitrate had been stored without safety measures for six years at the port. He added the government was determined to investigate and expose what happened as soon as possible. In agriculture, ammonium nitrate fertilizer is released into the soil to help plant growth. Under normal conditions, the substance does not explode easily. Explosives experts say the Beirut explosion was likely caused by a fire at a storage area for fireworks nearby. Boaz Hayoun works closely with the Israeli government on safety and issues involving explosives. He told the Associated Press, Before the big explosion, you can see in the center of the fire, you can see sparks. You can hear sounds like popcorn, and you can hear whistles. Hayoun said, Those are common signs of the burning of fireworks. Jeffrey Lewis, a missile expert at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies in Monterey, California, agreed. He said, If you have a fire raging next to something explosive and you don't put it out, it blows up. Ammonium nitrate has caused several earlier industrial explosions in countries including Germany, the United States, and China. In 1921, a massive explosion involving ammonium nitrate at a chemical plant killed more than 500 people in Oppau, Germany. And in 1947, a burning cigarette caused an explosion in Galveston, Texas, as workers were loading the fertilizer into a ship. It killed 581 people and injured 3,500. More recently, 173 people were killed at a factory in Tianjin, China. That 2015 explosion involved ammonium nitrate and other chemicals. Witnesses to the event said it felt like an atomic bomb had hit. Ammonium nitrate has also been used in terrorist acts in the United States. A truck filled with the fertilizer exploded in New York City in 1993 at the World Trade Center. Kuwait-born Ramzi Youssef was found guilty of the bombing 
and is serving a life sentence in a U.S. prison. On April 19, 1995, Timothy McVeigh, a former American soldier, left a truck in front of a federal office building in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Inside the truck was a powerful bomb made out of fertilizer, fuel, and other chemicals. McVeigh exploded the bomb, killing 168 people. For these reasons, ammonium nitrate is a tightly controlled substance. Most countries bar its storage in areas near fuel and sources of heat. Much of the European Union also requires that calcium carbonate be added to ammonium nitrate because it makes the fertilizer less likely to explode. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. City's theater industry remains closed because of COVID-19. But many theater workers are finding ways to earn money. Some Broadway performers now offer dance or musical training online. Other workers design jewelry or make toys. Still others sell skincare products. These occupations may not command pay equal to that of their old theater jobs, but Broadway's many now unemployed workers say any earnings are helpful. Amy Mikaliff is among them. Normally, she makes costumes, the clothing worn by actors in plays. She has worked on major Broadway productions including Hamilton and Frozen. Currently, her skills are being put to another use, toy making. But Mikaliff's creations are designed more for adult use than child play. Her soft, round toys are made to look like the new coronavirus. Each one sells for $23 at the online store Etsy. Mikaliff invites buyers to use the little corona balls when they feel angry, worried, or troubled. Sometimes you need to throw something against the wall. You need to step on something. Do you want to run that thing over with your car? Honey, be my guest, she said. Allie Solomon might like having a toy Corona ball herself. Until recently, she worked as a choreographer, a person who creates dances. Solomon's career in musicals was going strong when the coronavirus health crisis hit hard in mid-March. Like many in the industry, she was working on several productions at once including Trevor, the musical, and Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. But suddenly, all the projects came to a halt. You're at the top of your game after working for so many years, and now, to go find a job in another industry, where do you start? She said. Right now, Solomon is working as a salesperson, for skincare business Rodan and Fields. She also teaches dance in person and online. Actors' normal side gigs are catering, and even those jobs don't exist, said Gina DeWall, the lead actor in the upcoming musical Diana. DeWall has gone from acting to operating an online business she created in 2017 with her sister, Danny. 
At first, the company, called Broadway Weekends, offered in-person theater camps for adults. After the shutdown, she moved the training camps online. She began adding people she knew from the theater business as teachers. All my friends were unemployed, so it was very easy to ask around, she said. Adam Krauthammer is president of the Associated Musicians of Greater New York, the largest local union of professional musicians in the world. Krauthammer says the entire arts world is facing the biggest threat to its existence ever. He added that many of his union's 7,000 members may not return to Broadway theaters and other performance spaces. He worries that the sound of New York may soon be very different without help. If the right politicians and philanthropists and people who help the arts do not act to put together a program that will save culture and the arts in New York City, it's going to change as we know it forever. I'm Katie Weaver. A Japanese company has created a smart mask that aims to improve communication for people wearing face coverings to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The use of face masks has become the new normal in parts of the world still struggling to reduce spread of the coronavirus. However, masks and other kinds of coverings can affect the quality of communication between wearers. It can be more difficult to hear voices through the coverings. Many business and public spaces also have social distancing barriers in place, which also make it harder for people to be heard and understood. The wearable electronic device is designed to help improve speech interactions in such conditions. The Japanese startup company Donut Robotics calls its invention the Sea Mask. The device is meant to fit over other kinds of face masks commonly worn by the public. The Sea Mask is made of soft plastic material. It contains a built in microphone and has holes in the front to let air in. When it is turned on, the mask uses Bluetooth technology to connect to a mobile device. An app then helps users perform several actions, including turning speech into text, completing telephone calls, and making the user's voice louder. The device can also translate a person's voice from Japanese into eight other languages. The engineers who developed the smart mask had already built robots for use in Japanese airports to provide guidance and translation services to travelers. But with the travel industry currently suffering big losses, the future of the robots became unclear. So, Engineers sought to come up with a new product to fill a need. Taisuke Ono is the head of Donut Robotics. He told the Reuters news agency, We worked hard for years to develop a robot, and we have used that technology to create a product that responds to how the coronavirus has reshaped society. Ono told international broadcaster CNN 
that the company was able to raise money to develop the smart mask through a campaign on the Japanese crowdfunding service Fundano. He noted that the effort raised $265,000 in just the first 37 minutes. It was very surprising because it would usually take three or four months to get that kind of money, Ono said. The company produced a working model of the mask within a month by using software developed for its other robot products. The mask design was similar to one created years ago by one of the company's engineers that mapped facial muscles to interpret speech. Ono said the company plans to ship its first 5,000 sea masks to buyers in Japan starting in September. He is also looking to sell the devices in China, the United States, and Europe, and says he has received strong interest in the product. Donut Robotics plans to sell the devices for about $40 per mask in an effort to capture a mass market that did not exist until a few months ago. We hope that our device will be useful in a society where people naturally practice social distancing, the company states on its website. I'm Brian Lynn. VOA Learning English presents America's Presidents. Today we are talking about George Herbert Walker Bush. Before he became president in 1989, Bush had a lot of experience in government. He spent four years in the United States House of Representatives, worked as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and led the Central Intelligence Agency, or CIA. Then, for eight years, he was vice president under Ronald Reagan. Interestingly, in U.S. history, a person serving as vice president rarely becomes president after the sitting president leaves office at the end of his term. Before George H.W. Bush, the last time such an event happened was in 1836. At that time, Martin Van Buren took office after the two-term presidency of Andrew Jackson. Yet, neither Bush nor Van Buren was able to deal successfully with some of the problems facing the country during their years in office, or to persuade voters to elect them for a second term. While many people respect Bush for his foreign policy successes, his years in office are also remembered as a time of economic problems and social unrest. George Bush was born into a wealthy family in Massachusetts and raised in a Connecticut town near New York City. He had three brothers and a sister. Their father was a business leader who became a U.S. senator. Their mother was active doing public service work. The family employed servants but Mrs. Bush did not want her children's privileged position to make them think they were special. Instead, she taught them to work hard and help others. When he was a young man, George Bush moved away from home to attend a private high school in Massachusetts. There, he played baseball and soccer and was elected student body president. On his 18th birthday, Bush joined the U.S. Navy. 
For three years, he fought in World War II. At the time, he was the youngest pilot in the Navy and earned a medal for bravery. In early 1945, he married a young woman he had met at a dance. Her name was Barbara Pierce. After the war, she and George moved to Connecticut where he studied economics at Yale University and played on the school's baseball team. In time, they moved to the southern state of Texas. George Bush worked in the oil industry and became president of a company that sold oil drilling equipment. George and Barbara Bush mostly raised their four sons and one daughter in the Houston, Texas area. Another daughter died of cancer when she was a child. In time, George Bush decided to follow his father's example and enter politics. He became a Republican Party official. Then he was elected to the U.S. Congress, representing part of Houston. Despite having a home in Texas, opponents and the public connected Bush with the East Coast and the upper class. That image created some problems for Bush in the presidential election of 1980. By then, he had held other high offices in the federal government and had been successful as the head of the CIA. But voters liked another Republican candidate, former California Governor Ronald Reagan. Many Americans remembered Reagan from his days in movies and on television. When Reagan was nominated as the party's candidate for president, he asked Bush to be vice president. For eight years, Bush held the office and worked closely with Reagan on foreign policy and other issues. In 1988, Bush finally won the presidency in his own right. On entering the White House, the new president promised to continue many of Reagan's policies of limited government. While he was a candidate, Bush often said that, if elected, he would not raise taxes. Bush also said that he wanted the United States to be a kinder and gentler nation. He wanted especially to support community organizations in their efforts to reduce crime, homelessness, and drug abuse. He also signed legislation to help people with disabilities and to protect the environment. But Bush faced a number of problems. One was a large budget deficit, created in part by increased military spending during the Reagan years. Another were disputes in Congress with the Democratic Party, and another was a banking crisis. After years of problems in the savings and loan industry, more than 1,000 small financial institutions failed. In time, Congress agreed to spend billions of dollars to help the industry recover, and President Bush had to break his promise not to raise taxes. He pointed out that he needed to balance the budget. However, many Americans and some members of his own party felt betrayed. The economic troubles helped create a mood of unrest in the country. The feeling was strengthened by events around the world. Soon after Bush took office, the Chinese government launched a campaign to stop protests in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. A few months later, the Berlin Wall came down. 
the wall separated East and West Germany. Many considered its collapse to be the end of the Soviet Union's control of Eastern Europe. At the same time, the leader of Panama, Manuel Noriega, was threatening Americans. He was also accused of supporting drug traffickers and the drug trade in the United States. Bush answered all the events in a calm, cautious way. He tried to keep good relations with China and the Soviet Union. In time, he ordered military action in Panama and U.S. troops ousted Noriega. Supporters praised Bush's cool head and way of doing things. But critics questioned Bush's decisions. Some said he went too far. Others said he did not go far enough. The same criticisms and support were repeated during the Gulf War against Iraq. In brief, Iraqi leader Saddam Hussein ordered his forces to invade and occupy Kuwait. Bush and other world leaders created an international coalition to seek a diplomatic solution. When diplomacy failed, U.S. troops led international airstrikes against Iraq. Coalition forces also attacked on the ground. In a few weeks, the Iraqi leadership agreed to a ceasefire. Some criticized Bush for letting Saddam Hussein stay in power, but the American public largely approved of Bush's actions. He won praise for helping create an international coalition to answer the Iraqi occupation. The effort showed what some called a new world order, the U.S. and Soviet Union had even worked successfully together. Yet, soon after the end of the Gulf War, Bush failed in his efforts at re-election. The U.S. economy had entered a recession, and Bush was not able to connect effectively with voters, even though those who knew him personally said Bush was a kind, gentle person. One of his last acts as president was to write a note for the candidate who had beat him, wishing him well. George H.W. Bush retired to his home in Texas with his wife, Barbara. They also have a house in Maine. Bush often urged Americans to help others in their community. He put his words into action by volunteering with his church and supporting a local hospital. On his 90th birthday, Bush did something unusual to test his image as a cautious person. He celebrated by going skydiving. For many, Bush is remembered for his connection to other presidents. He is often linked to the Reagan years. Compared to Reagan, Bush is usually considered a less conservative leader as well as a less charismatic one. By the 21st century, historians began comparing the former President Bush with another president, his son, George Walker Bush who took office eight years after his father left it. I'm Kelly Jean Kelly. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. 